Kia ora, tēnā koutou. I had real trouble putting this together. I've had quite a, a diverse research career, putting curious fingers into a lot of research pies, as it were. So doing a quick 10 minute overview, overview was always going to be a challenge. I was also conscious that this talk will be available later and that concentrated the mind. To give you an idea of the challenge, here are the domains for which I was nominated. I created the word cloud on the right from the nomination statement itself for what it's worth. It's immensely satisfying to be awarded this prestigious fellowship and I'm grateful to the Academy for this honor. I wish to acknowledge my wonderful research mentors, Dr. Harvey Brown, Professor John Spencer, Dr. Sheila Williams, Dr. Phil Silver, and the late great Professor David Locker. All have given me opportunities, encouraged me, and provided crucial support at various times. I also wish to acknowledge some important early encouragement from Professor Peter Davis. Mentors such as these are vital for research and development. My career has been a bit of a journey with it taking quite a, a long time for me to find my niche. I was born in the northern Waikato coal mining town of Huntley and enjoyed a wonderful childhood and adolescence growing up there with my two brothers and later my baby sister and we enjoyed a neighbourhood full of tearaways. I was a precocious reader and speller, fully encouraged by my school teacher mother to make the most of that ability. I believe her crucial early support was vital for my research and editing career. Writing has always come easily. Growing up during the 60s and 70s also helped, of course. A generation earlier, my clever father was unable to attend secondary school because he had to help support his own family. I'm so lucky to have paid very little for any of my tertiary education, and I like to think that the state has had a good return on its investment in a boy from Kimahir School and Huntley College. It saddens me now to see how my generation has pulled the ladder up after itself in the intervening decades. My academic and research career has been a lot of fun, and I can assure you that it beats doing dentistry all day, every day. Compelled originally to undertake a research project as half of my MCOM dent degree at Otago, I soon found that it was by far the most interesting and diverting part of postgraduate study. And as soon as I laid eyes on, on the page proofs of my first published paper, that was it. It's still no less of a thrill three decades and hundreds of papers later. Over the years, the scope of my research endeavors widened, widened steadily with the initial work on um, older people's oral health, a survey of Manawatu Horofeno and nursing homes, leading to a move from the public health sector to a research fellowship at Adelaide with involvement in a large cohort study of older people. Otago then made a good offer and I found myself talking to Phil Silver and Richie Poulton about reviving the dental component of the, the world famous Dunedin study. This was a wonderful opportunity which allowed my colleagues and me to produce unprecedented findings on the natural history of oral conditions through early adulthood to middle age. That work continues, of course. Other opportunities came with an invitation to join David Locker and Hilary Broder's endeavours to develop a child oral health related quality of life measure simultaneously in a number of cultures. Some years later, David's untimely death meant that I had to continue that development and testing work, but more on that soon. New Zealand and then Australia decided to finally invest in more national oral health surveys, essential for monitoring the population's oral health. And that work has led to some very interesting and useful research. Finally, taking on the editorship of the New Zealand Dental Journal in 2007 enabled me to discover that I really enjoyed the way in which an editor is able to shape the research agenda and help junior researchers and indeed senior ones to get their findings out there. I have subsequently been editor in chief for two international journals and that work continues. Of course, these arrows are shown here parallel and reasonably tidy when in truth, it's a lot more chaotic and serendipitous than that. And it's not really a case of a light bulb suddenly coming on, it's more of a dull flickering with occasional bursts of light and insight and lessons and experience from each thread helping to illuminate, illuminate the others. It's a clumsy metaphor this, let's move on to some findings. I work in the fascinating field of dental epidemiology and health services research. 
Oral conditions are great for social epidemiology research because they're socially patterned, chronic and cumulative. You can look in someone's mouth and get a very good picture of not only their current oral disease experience, but their past experience too. Now, some might say that dental and oral conditions are trivial, trivial and do not really matter. Let's look at that. One in seven adults has detectable impacts on their daily lives, and that is higher in people with more decayed teeth or more missing teeth. That uh, prevalence of impacts rises to one in four with the, in those with chronic dry mouth, 95% of cases uh, of which are medication induced. <clears throat> Turning to children, tooth decay in very young children is perhaps our most sensitive marker of social and economic stress on families. In fact, the ill-considered early 1990s neoliberal trifecta of benefit cuts, market rents for state houses and the Employment Contracts Act was responsible for a detectable widen widening of ethnic inequalities in preschoolers' tooth decay experience during the five years which followed. The problem persists, requiring thousands of children every year to receive dental treatment under general anaesthetic in hospitals around the country. Such treatment is resource intensive, costing almost $18 million a year, making it a target for keen health service managers under the logic that they're only baby teeth which are going to fall out eventually anyway. Work we conducted in Wellington and then Auckland using our newly developed child quality of life measures, not only documented the impact of that decay, but also the great improvement in the daily lives of those children and their families once that decay had been treated by fillings and or extractions. That certainly put pay to any moves to, to remove the service. Turning to the Dunedin study, it's been a great privilege to work with Richie Poulton, Jonathan Broadbent, Tammy Moffat, Avshalon Caspi and the team, along with our wonderful study members, to make some really important contributions to knowledge of oral health and disease as we age. I've listed some of those findings here in relation to the two main oral conditions, tooth decay and gum disease. Throughout this important mahi, the emphasis has been very much on a social epidemiology approach, acknowledging the fact that health and ill health occur within a complex societal context. That is underlined by the points in the yellow box there, that there is continuity through the generations in the conditions, opportunities and behave, behaviours and other factors that lead to our NCD experience, and that the social inequalities which are observable in, in childhood continue to widen as we go through the life course. I get very irritated by those who seek to bolster their political capital by victim blaming. As we age, our adult socioeconomic position takes on more and more importance, at least with respect to cumulative conditions such as tooth decay, gum disease, and the tooth loss which results from them. This is, of course, very important for what happens once we reach old age. New Zealand, once famous for almost all of the adult population, population having no teeth at all, now has more older people with their own teeth than ever before. We know that at any given time, 5% of those older people are in a nursing home. But Joanna Broad's work in Auckland has shown that half will live in a nursing home at some stage. We also know from the late Jane Chalmers' work that the tooth decay increment in nursing homes is more than twice that of older people living in their own homes. And if someone has dementia as well, you can double that as shown here. And this unfortunate case is typical of what occurs relatively rapidly. We have a case of an, an older male um, and, and the deterioration of his dentition over the relatively short period of three years post um, admission. You might be alarmed to hear that in common with most other countries, New Zealand has no system for providing oral care support in nursing homes. I'm currently working with colleagues, Moira Smith, and Nairi Curse and their team to try to improve the situation. It is, of course, a very complex problem. Finally, my own, both my own aging and my decades of research experience have taught me some important lessons. We have to think about our health and well-being in life course terms. Most of us are lucky to reach old age. Whether we do that well is the net outcome of all the different exposures which we encounter along the way 
and ending up as a healthy older person is a lifelong project. The state, the community, Fano, and the individual all play crucial roles in that project. Health research is necessarily a collaborative undertaking involving many disciplines and not just clinicians. I continue to learn a great deal from my social science and biostatistics colleagues, as well as the clinicians. Finally, I wish to acknowledge my wonderful life and, uh, wife and family, my close collaborators, and the many other researchers with whom I have undertaken research and published findings. I wish also to thank the funders of our work. I also want to acknowledge the, other, the two other dental fellows of the Royal Society of New Zealand, both of whom are Australians, incidentally. Nodeira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa.